just just got a text message that Brother Bradley had made it to the Slovakian border, and uh, so we thank the Lord. Uh, but we're going to pray that the Lord would minister and keep His hand upon the church and the people there in Ukraine. Father, we thank you that you are a faithful on time God that is in control of every situation and circumstance. We pray tonight, Lord, for our brothers and our sisters, Lord, that's there in this war zone. I pray, Lord, for your peace. Pray, Lord, for your protection. Pray for your divine enablements and what the enemy meant for evil, God, that you would turn it around. May souls be saved and brought into the kingdom of God. We know that your coming is near and upon us. We thank you for the freedom that we have tonight to gather into your house and to worship you. I pray that the Spirit of the Lord would descend in this house. I pray that the divine enablements of heaven would flood this place, minister and strengthen and help and encourage as only you can do. In that name which is above every name, the name of Jesus, we thank you and we praise you for it and we bless your name. We bless your name tonight, Lord. There's no God like Jehovah. We magnify you. Magnify you, Lord. We magnify you tonight. Grant it, O oh Lord. Open up the windows of heaven. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Turn, shake somebody's hand. Tell them I'm glad to see you in the house of the Lord. Step across the aisle if you have to. Step over and shake four or five hands. Tell them I'm glad to see you. I don't know what you came to do, but I came to praise the Lord. I don't know what you came to do, but I came to praise the Lord. Oh, I don't know what you came to do, but I came to praise the Lord, hallelujah, 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 oh, I don't know what you came to do, but I came to praise the Lord, I don't know what you came to do, but I came to praise the
in control. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. God bless you as you're seated as a choir minister. Day. 
God like Jehovah. There's no 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 God like Jehovah. We're in revival with the Spencers from Riverdale, California. About four years ago, my face was smashed. My sinus cavity was fractured. I was a mess. I looked in the mirror and didn't know who it was. But that song kept coming, the words, there's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. Hallelujah. And before anybody came in to say anything about me getting out of Harris Hospital in Fort Worth, I was scheduled for two more surgeries. I texted my pastor on the platform and said, come pick me up at 2 o'clock this evening. I'm getting out of here. Hallelujah. And I did. Glory to God. And came to church that night. There's no God like Jehovah. 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 Jehovah, there's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. 
somebody ought to go ahead and praise him tonight. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Who can compare to our God? There's nobody. There's nobody like him. Glory, glory, glory. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, choir, for your ministry tonight in song. So glad that each one of you is here with us. I thought as I was watching them sing, I couldn't help in my peripheral vision but to see Brother Troy jumping around over there strumming on his uh, mandolin and uh, singing the whole time he's trying to play. There's no God like Jehovah. Hallelujah. I know, I know. But see, you don't, You wasn't there in the ICU room when I walked in and they had everything plugged up and said he won't, he, he's probably not going to make it through this. But a mom and a daddy that was saying, hey, brother, no, he's not saved yet. We're, we're praying, Lord, going to raise him up out of this so he can get saved. And then if he needs to go on, he can die and go on. But right now he's not saved, so we know. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the Lord came through. And the Lord came through. Got a call from Sister Brittany Lacey and she said, Pastor, you wouldn't you wouldn't just you wouldn't believe all that the Lord's doing. She said, We're trying to get there. We got fever and stomach bug and everything going on. She said, But this this Joshua boy and she said, even since last Sunday she sent me a video and she said, All right, I'm gonna help you stand up one, two, and he hollered three. She, she said, uh, I got to cry and got so tickled about hearing him holler three that we counted till he just got to where he was laughing. He just, three, three, three. Well, if you'd have been there beside him, at the hospital again when they said there's nothing there. Look, show I'll show you this scan. His his brain is as smooth as the said there's there's no wrinkles, said there's no activity. Said, I can promise you he'll never he's eating she said he's eating breakfast, lunch and supper and anything he can get a hold of. She said he's done more talking this week. She said it's just The other day in the service, he started singing while he was watching online right now. He's, we started singing, I Surrender All. And she looked down at him, and he was mouthing the words, I Surrender All. Y'all y'all ain't ready. I'm, I'm telling you, there's things that's happening. God's doing some great things among us. And the best is yet to come. I said the best is yet to come. Good to see Brother Allen in the service today. Been praying for him. Praise the Lord. His recovery. Brother Jerry Hawkins here tonight. Good to see him. Praise the Lord. Now, contrary to what Brother Jerry Sprayberry will tell you, Sister Heather did not push him down the stairs. He did have back surgery, and and uh, but we are thankful the Lord is helping us. And is here with us. The trumpet is going to sound soon. And the church is going to be caught out. And I don't want to miss it. I'm not going to miss it by the help and the grace of God. I'm, I'm going to make it. Tonight in the service is friends of mine. And I haven't got a chance to talk to him yet. I'm just going to be honest with you. Okay, I'm going to change my name for a moment from Randy to Frank. Sometimes people call and I want them to have a window. Just a moment. And uh, I don't know that I've ever told anybody 
No. Because he called and said, if I could just have a moment. I said, no, Brother Mike. I want you to take the service, and I want you to share with us how the Lord has spoke to you. And so whatever he feels led tonight to do. We have a lot of missionaries, and I'm thankful for all of them. I'm thankful for all of them. For how many years did you work construction, brother? Since he was 16, and he is now 51, okay, a young 51. I can still take him on the basketball court, though. He's younger than me, but I can still take him. He has a lot of family here. He has a great heart to serve and to please the Lord. and felt like the Lord has called him to Tanzania. He told us and I don't want to go into all the details but he has sacrificed and given for the sake of the call and so I want you to share a little bit and then we're going to take an offering okay it's it's okay I know you're not in Riverdale but this is this is your family right here okay we we had your daughter here. She calls me mom and dad. Not mom, but dad. <laughs> Wilma was here with us. We took her to camp. and and uh, But I commend you, before you take this pulpit, I want you to know that as a brother in Christ, I love you. And I appreciate you. I often think that when they looked at David after he slew Goliath and they said, whose boy are you? And he said, I'm Jesse's boy. How Jesse's heart swelled. And I know that Brother McMillan Sr., Brother Spencer is proud of you. But we are thankful and we appreciate you. And Sister Jana, when you go, and when you get overwhelmed, you remember that Faith Tabernacle is behind you, and we're praying for you, and we love you, and you are not going alone. Because the God that is sending you has brought you to us to help hold the ropes, to help you to be able to go to minister to these children and to these people. Mikey. We love you, Wilma, and we want you to come tonight and just share your heart with us. And I want you to give a warm Texas welcome to these, our family from California. Would you do that as they come? Thank you, thank you, thank you from the bottom of my heart. I've been treated in a lot of ways in the last month as we've been on the road, but I've never been treated like that. <laughs> and we do consider you family also. In Riverdale, we've had the privilege of having Brother and Sister Snow at our church camp and uh, outstanding messages Messages that he preached and touched our hearts and he'll never know the results until he stands before our Savior. And he's going to put a big, big old crown on your head for the messages that you preached and the people that you have helped. And I know not only in Riverdale, California, but here in Denton, Texas and the places that he goes, God has used him and I consider him my big brother. 
And then uh, you've let us have Tim and Amy a few times and uh, hymn conference. And uh, we say thank you for that also. I know it's not easy to let your staff go. There's times when we, our staff leaves from Riverdale and puts a hole for that service, but we're so thankful for your generosity. And uh, we are excited to be here tonight. Um, we just, we're overjoyed, really. It's a, it's a highlight of the trip, to be honest with you. I got a call from a man today in Riverdale, and he was telling me, he goes, Dude, I do not know who's going to be at Brother Snow's church tonight, but I want to meet him. Well, if you remember how Brother Snow talked about us this morning, I was trying to think, I was, I was like, who's going to be at Brother Snow's tonight? And then I remembered that it was me. But uh, I wanted to meet him too after Brother Snow. I was like, wow, that's a pretty good guy. But anyway, um, I looked over at Sister Jan a while ago when Sister Snow was singing. I said, wow, she can blow. I didn't know she could still sing like that. Man, that was, so the, now it's out. I don't know where she went, but um, I am the director of our church camp, and she always sits there so prompt and so prim, prim and proper, proper, and uh, so now she's going to have to sing. As, uh, she's, uh, she always sits there like she doesn't sing, and, uh, but we're going we're gonna to fix that. Well, praise the Lord. We're going to go on here with the service. I just wanted to say thank you. Pastor Spencer sends his greetings to you and your congregation. And uh, he was uh, he told us today, he said, please tell them all uh, there in Denton, Texas, that they said hello from Riverdale, California. But God is good. Amen. Amen. And uh, he is still in charge. I don't care what your newspaper says. I don't care what comes over the television. But God is still in control. Amen? Amen? They can drop bombs here in Denton, Texas tomorrow, but God is still in control. Amen? Hallelujah. I am so thankful to know that man, my Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ, the one who died on the cross for my sins. And one of these days, he's going to say, okay, Gabriel, go blow your silver trumpet. Hallelujah. And he's going to step out there on that cloud, and he's going to blow. Hallelujah. And all of us, whoo, hallelujah. The dead in Christ are going to rise first. Hallelujah. I always said I want to be standing at the graveside of some dear Christian friend whenever that trumpet blows and they rise first. And I know, brother, hallelujah, in just a few more minutes, it's my turn. Hallelujah. Because us which are alive and remain will be caught up in the clouds of glory with him. Hallelujah. I'm so glad to know him as my Savior. Hallelujah. We went to, uh, on this trip, we were trying to do a fun things because we have the young people with me and uh, a, a couple of my, my children, but uh, Janelle, uh, sorry, uh, Wilma, you can make your way up here because I'm going to have you testify that you're way back there in the back and I'm going to have you testify up here. But we went to uh, the, uh, the Ark. If anybody's, if you've ever been there, you know what I'm talking about, but it had just several places in the beginning. And it spoke volumes to me at the things that I read about it, but in the beginning is where it all began. He knows about your sickness. He knows about your lost loved ones in the beginning. He knows where you're going to be at tomorrow. He knows the hairs on your head. In the beginning, where it all began, my Savior, my Lord, the God who took nothing and made everything. Amen. And I'm just excited to be here tonight. I'm excited to know him again, once again, as my Savior. He lives down in my heart, and he is the one who has called me to do what he's called me to do. And I want to be faithful to do it. So uh, Wilma's going to come and testify tonight. Um, she did spend some time around in some youth camps, and um, uh, once again, we have to thank uh, Brother and Sister Snow at a, at a time in our life when we, we needed some help. I called upon them, and they said, come on. And uh, when Wilma would come back home, she had, she had, some, she had changed. She had, there's, there's some change in her life, Hallelujah. Brother Snow, and uh, 
I'm so thankful for Christian brothers and sisters. When you're in need of a help, they can hold your arms up. And, and, and that's what a brother and sister is for, right? Amen. And uh, I want her to testify and just tell, tell us what God is doing in her life. And uh, she was excited to be here tonight. And she's telling me about all these friends and all this stuff and all these boyfriends. And I was like, how many boyfriends do you have there? So... so good to be here tonight. I'm so glad to see all my friends. Um, I'm so glad I got to come on this trip and minister with my family. I can't wait to see what God's going to do in my life, how he's going to use me for his glory. Yes. I love them tonight. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right, Mikey, can you stand up and holler real loud and tell us what God's doing for you? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right, Sister Jana, I want you to come and testify tonight. Praise the Lord. Well, I love the Lord. I'm thankful for his goodness and his mercy. Oh, I'm thankful for the spirit of the Lord. I just, he's usually the crier, and I'm telling you from the beginning of that service, I just Oh, just wept and wept, and I'm just thankful for the Lord's Spirit. Um, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. And uh, faith is the basis of our Christian walk, right? We're all people of faith, and we have faith that God saves, and faith that he delivers, and faith that he heals and he provides, and all those things. And I grew up all my life just having faith in the Lord. And I would have said I had great faith. Um, but I just want to share with you a little bit of uh, my side of the journey getting to this place of going to Africa. Um, it was 2005, and we were at our house, and I remember I was sitting on the couch, and he was just standing there in the living room, and the phone call came from a a man who had preached our church camp that year, and he had a work in Africa, and when Michael answered the phone, he said, how you doing? And Mike said, fine. He said, do you want to go to Africa? And Michael just went to a bucket of tears, and I just sat there saying, what in the world? This guy has lost it. And... Uh, <laughs> I said, um, there was no, when he said, will you marry me, there was no, yeah, and by the way, in a few years, we're going to go to Africa. <laughs> that wasn't in the deal. <laughs> I don't know. And um, I, he got off the phone. He says, we're going to Africa. And I said, well, you can go to Africa, and I can support you from right here. <laughs> and um, at the time, I was expecting Wilma. And he did go the first time by himself, and he went the second time by himself, and he stayed there for three months. And uh, it was a long three months, and I thought, you know, when he came home, he got to take care of that itch he had. <laughs> and... Um, but you know what? The Lord didn't call husbands and wives to be divided in their ministries. And um, I felt really satisfied where I was. And I did not understand his discontent. And that's what I felt about it. I felt like, why is he discontent with what we're doing? With where the Lord has us? I mean, I teach in the Christian school. I give my time we teach a Sunday school class. We sing in the choir. We do youth service. Um, I felt like we were extremely busy in the ministry. And so why did he feel this need to go? And he'll share um, his part of the story of how and why he did feel this need. But I didn't really understand it. And, you know, when people would talk to us about it and 
I would, you know, say, well, Michael this and Michael that and Michael, you know, and it was all his ministry and his calling and his feeling. And I knew that that really wasn't right. But at the same time, it felt like so much. Um, if you jump down to verse 8 uh, in this chapter, it says, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place where he should have to receive as an inheritance, obeyed. And that's a nice place to stop right there. You know, he obeyed, he followed. But the last part of the verse is the really the part that makes it happen that puts it into this faith chapter. And that's the part that says, and he went out not knowing whither he went. And see, in my life, I'm the numbers person. It has to make sense to me on paper. I got to see how it's going to add up and how we can make this work. And, and so I was constantly, when he would say, I think we're just going to go full time, I was kind of talking him down off that ledge, you know. Well, we need to, you know, we, we have this bill and that bill, and those things have to be taken care of first. And, you know, you can't just walk off and leave these things, and we have this obligation. And, and I had all these reasons why in my heart and mind it didn't work for us to just go. And um, I started really praying about it because the longer it went, the more uh, unsettled he he felt and he became and and don't get me wrong he he made lots of trips to Africa so you know if it was just gonna be a few trips and then he was gonna be happy it should have already happened and um, I was doing a devotional and it was on faith and the very last day of that devotional the gentleman that was giving it said we say we have all faith in God and yet, things keep us awake at night. And I got, I felt that conviction hit my heart. And I really had to get on my knees. And it took a little while, praying and saying, now, Lord, <laughs> I was trying to reason it out with him. But you know what he did? He changed me. Because that's what happens when you get on your knees and you honestly ask the Lord what would you have me to do? And if this is really what you've called my husband to do, I've got to feel that same calling or we're going to be a house divided. And I could see that, you know, even that division in ministry is hard on your kids. Um, so I did. I got on my knees. And the day, I, I remember the day I called him <clears throat> and I said, told him about the, the devotional that I had been doing, and I said, and you know, I could have ignored it because really, I sleep really good at night. Things don't really keep me awake. So I could have kind of brushed that off. I said, but I really knew that, that Lord was, the Lord was really talking to me. And I said, and I, I, I really prayed about it, and I, I'm ready to do, to step out in faith and to do whatever you feel like the Lord is leading you to do, I'm willing and he said, great, I'm going to quit my job. <laughs> and I about had a heart attack right there. <laughs> uh, but I said, whatever you feel like, whatever you feel like. And, you know, um, faith isn't just saying that we believe. But faith really is taking that step when you don't see what's going to come next. And... Um, on this trip alone, the Lord has just given miracle after miracle. Um, I don't even, I, I couldn't even begin to just tell you every step of the way. From the very first service we were in, the Lord's amazing blessings there that just made us know we were walking in the center of his will. And I love the Lord, and I'm thankful, and I, I covet your prayers on this rest of this journey that we're going on, but I do love the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, praise the Lord. Thank you. And you laugh, but uh, just about a month ago, I pulled into Riverdale, California, 
and I parked the truck that uh, was a company truck full of finished tools. I'd been working in Southern California since the, about the 1st of May, and uh, I'd already called the boss. We'd already had a meeting with him, but I uh, shut the truck off, and in a sign of killing the cow and burning the plow, I walked away. Eight years, worked for the company, was a, one of their better men, foreman, and uh, I said, Lord, here I am. They have told me out of kindness that I can have work anytime I'm in the area, but when I get back home in just a few more days, I walk in my faith. And uh, God's going to lead. He's going to guide us. He's going to direct us. I, I'm not fearful. I'm not fearful one bit. Um, I, I, and maybe I'm, maybe I'm a little weird, Brother Snow, but I'm just like, where's the next challenge? Come on, Lord. What are you going to do next? <laughs> because he's done so much for me. He's never failed me. He's never forsaken me. Hallelujah. But um, we... Uh, I was 10 years old. I was sitting in a uh, chapel service, a Christian school, and uh, I was sitting about fourth row over here on this side, and we had a missionary from Sierra Leone, Africa, Brother and Sister Woods, and uh, they are retired now. They, they, Brother Woods actually comes to our church in Riverdale now, but at the time they were missionaries to Sierra Leone, Africa. Sister Woods come walking down the side aisle, and she was singing, What a Mighty God We Serve. And he's the same same, same God. He's mighty in everything that he does. And uh, he come, she came down the aisle, and I felt like, I don't know, I, I've tried to explain it on this trip that maybe it was a hand. I don't know. It was an impression. It was just a feeling down, down deep inside. And God said, you will have a work to do in Africa. Well, I was 10 years old, and that was all well and good, but I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know how I was going to get there. I didn't know anything about that. I mean, I went on, and I played. I like to have breaks, PE, and eat lunch, you know. But uh, time went on. I ended up getting married, as Sister Janice said, and we had uh, two children. The third one was on his way when I got the call. And, uh, uh, brother, you can go ahead and hit that first video. And I went to Africa for the very first time. And there I met Brother Jonas Kadegi. Brother Jonas is 37 years old. Uh, he's, been, he's a native of Africa there in Moshi, Tanzania, East Africa. And he uh, has been there all of his life, working with his family. His father was an, uh, an excellent missionary pastor, uh, started many works, had, had many ministries going on. And uh, one day, they, the family came home, and they found him deceased on the side of the house. And uh, they thought that maybe it was just a heart attack of some type. The family went ahead and did an investigation because they didn't feel like that was right. And... Um, they come to find out that he had been murdered for the cause of Christ. Yes, some men had been hired to come and kill him. But Brother Jonas picked up the mantle, and he kept his father's work going as long as he could. And as different things went on, he passed them on to other ministers. But he still works in and around uh, Moshi. He works in an orphanage, and he's working among the Maasai people, the Maasai tribe. And the Maasai tribe is a, a large tribe. They go throughout Africa, and they they uh, um, pro, a lot a lot in Tanzania and into Kenya, but they they stretch throughout all Africa. So right now um, we were uh, working and going and just doing what we needed to do. We was working some in the orphanage, and one day he said he said we are going to go to the Rift Valley. Well. The Rift Valley, I've always wanted to go to the Rift Valley from the very first time I stepped on the, on, on the continent and uh, never had the chance to go. And uh, so we, we, we went. It was in the middle of the week, and uh, we pulled over uh, a little hill, and uh, I said, what in the world are we doing here? I said, I don't see a church here, and you said we were going to church. And he goes, don't worry, my friend, don't worry. So we got out of the truck, we walked over a little hill, and there was a group of people, they were singing and praising and worshiping God. And uh, that was the beginning of this, this journey here, because when I left that day, I felt like God said, you are to build a church for these people. Go ahead. It's a lot of miles from Riverdale to Africa.
That's the area, that's the land that was given to us to build our first church. When I arrived, that's the crowd that was there. Uh, we went back on Sunday and had an excellent service. Brother Noah and his nephew and his son gave us land there to build a church. And uh, we're building a 40 by 50 uh, block building. I didn't know how I was going to build this block building. I uh, went back to the States after the Lord told me that. And I, I spoke in Riverdale. And that was all well and good. And they were happy for me. And uh, I went to uh, Brother Doug Spencer's church in uh, Avondale. And he, my brother-in-law, and after I got done finish, after I got done speaking and, and showing the need that they have there of the people meeting under a tree, he stood up and he says, "I want to give you the first eight thousand dollars to get that church started," and uh, that's where it began. I went back to Riverdale. Riverdale helped out. I went and talked to a, a Catholic man that I was working with, and he had asked me where I had been, and I told him. And I said, "I uh, was out in, uh, in Tanzania, and I'm, I'm going to build a church." And he goes, "Well." How are you going to do that? And I said, well, I don't know, but God's going to provide. And he goes, well, I, uh, I have this Catholic fund that we have in our, our, our business, and we give to Catholic churches, and we give to help with the Catholic ministries. He says, I'm going to give you $3,000. So the Catholic man gave me $3,000, and uh, the, it, it just began to go. Um, by the time I went back, we had all $20,000. That's what it cost to build the block church from ground up and labor included. Metal trusses, metal windows, metal doors. You can tell that it's just not easy to run down to Home Depot or Lowe's and get everything, but you go from one place to the next place and you buy some cement here, and if they don't have enough, you go buy cement from another man. We uh, buy rebar from one guy. Well, God told me, he says, I want you to buy the block for a dollar. He says, I'm going to give them to you for a dollar. I was like, okay, Lord. So when I got back into Africa to start this project, I told Brother Jonas, I said, we need to go see some men that are, that are selling block. He goes, no, I got a few places. So um, I already knew what he had told me. Jonas had told me they're two bucks a piece. Well, I don't think I had told him that I have to find these blocks for a dollar. So I went to the first man, and I, I saw, hi, how you doing? I said, I'm from America. I'm here to build a church down here in Muita. And I, I said, I, I need to find some block for a dollar said, you have anything like that for sale? And he looked at me and kind of chuckled. And he says, no, I got them for $2, but not a dollar. And I said, well, God spoke to me to buy these things for a dollar. So I said, thank you so much. And I went to the next man, and the story goes on. And he, he would tell him to sell them to me for a buck fifty. And I said, well, thank you, but I have to find them for a dollar. I went to the last man as we was getting ready to turn down the dirt road. Went to the man there, and I said, hey, buddy, I said, I'm uh, here from America I'm going to be building a church down here in Moita. And I, I said, I need, to, I need block for a dollar. God told me I was going to find them for a dollar. I said, and if you can't help me out, I'm going to go on down the road. But I know what God told me to do. And he looked at me and he goes, you're building a church? I go, yes, sir. He goes, how many block do you need? And I said, about 3,000. He goes, I'll sell them to you for a dollar. So he sold them to me for a buck. And... Uh, when God tells you something, stick with it. Don't give in because it is going to happen. Hang on. Hang on. So uh, we got our contractor out there, and he worked, and uh, he did a fine job. Um, he pulled up with a two-foot square. Uh, well, And you see, I tried my hand at it, too. That was the only picture I took there like that because after I got up and I stretched my back, they took the trial from me, and they said, we'll do it. <laughs> you can tell I wasn't a, the mason. I could organize it, but I wasn't going to be the best to help there. And um, so uh, I forgot I was going to tell a story there. What did I tell? I started it, and I forgot. But anyway, unimportant. And we... We got the... Uh, we had to get rock. We had to get the... the Waters. Oh, yes, there. Thank you. So he showed up with a square, a two-foot level, a plumb line, and this big old ball of string. He had no stakes. He went and chopped a couple of sticks off of a tree that was left standing and drove them in the ground. And he started pulling all these lines, and he used this str his uh, square on some unsquare block. And I was, like, scratching my head, and I was like, oh, Lord, who do I have here? Am I going to have to fire him on this first day? You know, I had all kinds of things going through my head. 
So he went and took him a little water break, and I said, I, I told Brother Jonas, I said, I brought me a 100-foot tape, so if we need to check this thing, I can, you know. I was being really smart, Brother Reno. So we pulled it from corner to corner, and would you believe it? He was one quarter of an inch out. <laughs> I went put my 100-foot tape back into the truck. I said, well, he knows how to build in Africa. I'm just going to sit here and watch. <laughs> So uh, I, I, I wasn't all that smart, but uh, as they build, you can see there's kind of a, a, a line there. Um, there's a difference in the block. That's where our foundation uh, uh, footing starts. They put the block on edge at that point, and then they turn it. Uh, they, I'm sorry, they put that on flat, and then they turn the, the walls on edge. Uh, you can tell that this side is a little higher than the other side. The ground is pretty uneven. The terrain is kind of rolling hills. And, uh, but they, they were able to take care of all of that. You saw in the footings that they, they do something a little different. They don't just fill them, full them, full them full of concrete. They actually put red lava, rock, block, red lava rock in there, and then they pour the cement, and it ties it all together. Their construction is a little different than ours. You can see OSHA-approved scaffolding. Um, I didn't put my 105 pounds up there. I left that to them. And uh, they just climbed right up there. It was no problem for them. Uh, we ended up building a baptismal. They're parging the inside. And uh, we'll tell you a story about that. We have more pictures at the end of the slide about that. But, but God honored even in there. And uh, we were able to baptize some people. Everything's built right there in town. They don't have any type of a jig or anything. They, it's, they put it on the ground. And everything. they don't have no tape measures. They just measure this piece of metal, this piece of metal. And here they go. And uh, the craziest and oddest things I've ever seen. But uh, it turned out to be a beautiful building, and you'll see that when we get there. Um, here's here Brother Jones. We are in this. It was uh, just a site two weeks ago. And uh, Mike came from Riverdale, California. And we went, we bought the material, we got the contractor started to dig the footers and he dug, he dug, we went and bought the blocks and today we have our two windows already on the walls and, and uh, they are beautiful and we have other windows uh, in Moshi, they are still in manufacture, after that we'll put the truss on because they're also being made right now as we speak. In two weeks, we will have our church ready. Um, thank you very much, people of Riverdale, California, for helping us with the church. We have really been praying about this, and you have provided the answer. God used you, and you become the answer of our prayers. So may the Lord richly bless you. Amen. So, uh, and you notice in those windows and how they were all nice and curved. Um, I had went to the metal manufacturer guy there, and I said, I just need some straight bars, you know. I, you know, I didn't even, I, tried, I don't want it to look like a jail cell, but I just want something straight, you know, and nothing fancy. Well, he came back with those windows and surprised me half to death. They have this big tractor rim. It has a little notch or stub on it, and they put the bar in there, and they start heating it up. And they just bend it right around that rim until they make the desired uh, pieces of arch, uh, the circumference that they want. And they did an outstanding job. You saw the people were in there worshiping God. That was the very first service they had in there. Almost a full building, just on my first service. I was not there. They called me and said, Brother Mike, can we use the building? Um, we have the roof on it. And I said, absolutely, that's what it's for. So uh, I said, use it for the glory of God. So they've parged the inside, they've parged the outside, and there is the building in Moshi, Tanzania. The need is still great. Uh, Mike, Mike will tell you about it. We have many churches. He has gone with me for about maybe four or five more churches that are made of, out of mud and manure. And uh, we would like to change those to black churches if God will help us. Thank you, and God bless you. So this gentleman right here, I don't know how old he is. Uh, he 
is, they say he's very old, but uh, he is the man who has given us property for the building that we are building now. Um, but when we were in the process of building the ch first church, he got saved. And he, went, he called Brother Jonah, actually, and said, I want to be baptized. Well, I didn't know what to do. I did not know what that all entailed. So I asked Brother Jonas, I said, what, how are we going to baptize him? I said, there's no water around. The only water I'm bringing that we have is what I'm bringing. And uh, he goes, well, we'll need to go pick him up. We'll take him into town. We'll rent a swimming pool the from a... Today. This is their church. Uh, and that man also, he's the man that gave us this land. And uh, they got together and built this mud church. And uh, by the help of the Lord, who would like a better church than this? Like the one we're building up there. We can have one here too. So um, I, was, I was praying one evening at the house and asking God's direction, and um, it, was, it was quite a chore to just go and get this man baptized. And God said, well, build a baptismal at each one of these churches. So I went back the next day. I said, hey, you guys got to stop construction. I need a baptismal built here. We're going to have a baptismal in three days. So they built me a baptismal. We filled it for the water, and you can see that we had a baptismal. We, we baptized the man. Um, after we baptized him, I turned around, and there was 15 more Maasai ready to be baptized. So you can see that we went ahead and had a baptismal service that day. Uh, we just stopped work and, and went, to, went to town. You can see what their churches look like. Um, of course, the church that I started with, uh, we called it the Tree Church because they had no building at all. It is a smaller congregation. The, uh, the other congregation had cement bags that were sewn together. And um, we, we were able to have some services, some outstanding services there. And uh, then they were able to put enough money to, put, uh, to build this church. This church is built out of manure and mud. And they compact it all together on those sticks that they've gathered. They put some tin roof on there to shield them from the weather. But uh, it, it's, it's a blessing to get the, a block building built because with the humanity and the humidity, and the manure, and uh, mud, it, uh, it's, it gets a little stiff in there during the service. But um, we're thankful. We're thankful for what he has done and what he is allowing us to do. So that's, that's, that's kind of a, a side job, all right? So what we, we were working in an orphanage, and uh, that, that door closed, and before it even closed, the Lord was dealing with us to, to work even deeper and farther in, into Africa and the city of Moshi. So I asked Brother Jonas one day, I said, now, uh, is there another orphanage or a school around, something else, you know, that, that we need a home base? We need, we need uh, to be able to reach this community. And uh, he said, you know what? He says, there is. There's a school for sale. And I said, let's go see it. He goes, we can't. I said, why? He said, because the people that are, have it right now, they don't know it's for sale. The owners don't live there. And uh, we can't just walk in. I said, well, I got to see it. I'm leaving in three days. So he called the realtor. The realtor came, and I don't know how the realtor got in, but we got in. So um, we walked in, and I had my camera out, and I was taking some pictures of the, of the, the layout of the school, but um, it's a school of 200 children. They're five-year-old to 10-year-old uh, kids, uh, boys and girls mixed. They do have boys schools or girls schools, but this is uh, a school that has boys and girls. And there's five and a half acres. Uh, it's in town. It's on city water, city electrical, city sewer. So uh, it's perfect for us. Uh, it has a boys' dormitory and a girls' dormitory. It has a couple of buildings that are not completely done. They're in the middle of construction. It has an outdoor kitchen with outdoor dining. And it has four little buildings that make up the school. It's all running properly right now. There's, we would just take over ownership at this time. But our desire is that once we take over, we put in English language along with Christian education 
right beside their native language that they're learning and they're being taught so that we can teach them about God. Uh, I talked to Brother Jonas. I said, how do we go about that? This is a public school. He says, I know the superintendent of schools. And he says, and he's already said, it's okay. So before we even got there, God has already gone before us. Hey Amen. He's already fighting our battles, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. We're supposed to be uh, supposed to go the begin the beginning of next month. Sister Jenna, myself, and Glenna are going, and we desire your prayers for that trip. We're going to negotiate the purchase of this school, and uh, once again, we'll be able to take ownership of that, and then uh, put in some good old Christian education. And uh, we have more Christians in the country of Africa. Amen. I dream big. I dream very big. And I told my wife, I said, just imagine. I said, just dream this. I said, we start with one school. And the superintendent of schools says, wow, these kids are learning great. These are wonderful kids. He says, put it in this school. And then go put it in this school. And before long, the whole city of Moshi has Christian education. Amen. I'm looking forward to that, and I just, I got big dreams, big ideas, and um, I just, uh, I'm thankful for a wife who calms me down every once in a while and says, hey, take it one step at a time, boy, one step at a time, but uh, God has been faithful. He's good to us. What else am I missing, baby? Tell me. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, she wanted me to tell you that we do have a couple of needs. Uh, one, of course, is the school. The second one is a vehicle. And uh, those costs, uh, I think the last time I checked, about forty to $45,000. dollars um, They do have them in Dar Salaam. But we've been using the vehicle uh, uh, that belongs to the orphanage that we were working at. But uh, we don't want to continue to do that if we're not working there. But uh, God will even provide for that. So keep that in your prayers that the Lord would help us. And then also monthly support. Monthly support is something that we need so we can be on the mission field for long periods of time. And uh, that would take care of uh, what small uh, responsibilities we have in Riverdale. But most of it will be going to us in uh, Africa to help us live there. Um, it's not a lot, but you still have some expenses. You still have some food to buy and things like that. Um, but uh, we do have information. We have a table set up in the back. We have prayer cards, brand new. They were actually just uh, passed out this morning at Brother Adam's church. So we have a, a great big box. So everyone, everybody here has a prayer card. Please take it home, put it somewhere uh, where you will remember to pray for us because we do need uh, his hand in everything we do. I need his wisdom most of all. I want his wisdom in every decision that I make. That's, the, that's probably the most important thing to me is that, God, I need your wisdom as I, as I make the decisions and do what needs to be doing, uh, the things I need to do as far as more building or helping children. Wherever we're at, we need God's wisdom and his direction there. But um, once again, we're thankful to be here. Um, Sister Jana, have I missed anything? I, I try to remember everything, and sometimes I have short-term memory loss. And I'm sorry? I think I did good. Oh, woo. Got a brownie button tonight. I won't be long. I'm not Chuck. Okay. I know he preaches really long. Uh, I love my brother-in-law. I know they've been here many times and preached some revivals. We enjoy his preaching in Riverdale. Jeremiah. The 18th chapter and the second verse, it says, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheel. As I was reading the scripture, I, I, uh, Let's go on to verse 4, and it says, uh, And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hands of the potter, so he made it again another vessel, and seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in my hand, O house of Israel. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. For this time to be here tonight, we're so thankful for your goodness, your mercies. We're so thankful that we can spread the gospel of Jesus Christ, not only here in America, but across this world. Bless us in this short time of this message tonight, and we'll give you the glory and the praise. 
Amen. I, uh, as I was reading, I come upon that uh, second verse, and it says, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I would cause thee to hear my words. And I was, I was praying, and the Lord says, there's one small problem that we have in our churches. And I was like, okay. <laughs> Lord, help me to hear what you're saying here because I, I don't want to be accused of that. I, and he says so many times we come to the house of God for the wrong reason. He said we come to the house of the God to visit to, to um, the house of God to visit with our friends to see what the next person is wearing to find out what they're going to be doing this next week. And I said, Lord, don't let me be guilty of that. Don't let me be guilty of that. Let me, oh God, to come to your house to seek you. I tell my children, I said, if you don't put something in, you're not going to get anything out. If you come to visit with your friends, if you come to see what's going on, if you come just to relax and just to get away from the house, you're going to leave the same way. You're going to leave that way. You're going to leave feeling like, why in the world did I go to the house of God? I didn't feel anything tonight. But I encourage you as a church, and, I, and, and I'm pleased, believe me, I'm not scolding in any way. I enjoyed what I saw here tonight. But if you don't put in something, you're not going to get anything out of the house of the Lord. I was reading on and was talking about the, the potter. And uh, I was like, Lord, I, I, I'm, I'm talking to the Lord. You're, you're hearing my prayer, okay? That's, that's kind of how this is going tonight. And I said, Lord, I said, I've been on that wheel as a, as a young man. And I can't say that I have a spotless life. And I... Probably a bunch of us in here could feel the same way. You don't have to raise your hands. And I said, Lord, if you have to put me on that wheel again and crush me and make me something better than I am, then please do it. I said, because the pottery that I am now is, has been broken. And uh, he says, he told me, he says, that's, that's not a problem. And encouraged my soul that day in, in my devotion. And he says, I've used broken pottery before. You know, you always think of, of him using a, 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 a pottery that he's made in the, the likeness and, and his form and, you know, his, his, his will and his way. But I got to read him in uh, Judges. And it says... And it was so when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and the interpretation thereof that he worshiped and returned unto the host of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord hath delivered unto your hand the host of Midian. Yeah. And he divided the 300 men into three companies and he put a trumpet in every man's hand and with empty pitchers and lamps within the pitchers. Do you hear that? With empty pitchers and lamps within the pitchers. And he said unto them, Look on me and do likewise. And behold, when I come to the outside of the camp, it shall be that as I do so shall ye do. When I blow with a trumpet, I and all that are with me, then blow ye the trumpets also on every side of all the camp and say the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. I was encouraged when I read that because Gideon had given them all pots and they put it over the lamp and they went into war. And at the right time, they broke the pitchers. And I was like, Brother Snow, I can be a broken pitcher. <laughs> How exciting, huh, to be broken. But I said, Lord, if you have to use me to be broken so that men and women can see Jesus Christ, so that you can be illuminated through that broken picture, then Lord, use me. 
take my life. Lord, to use it for your glory. Lord, help me to whatever capacity or facet you have me. Lord, I'm willing. And so I said, well, okay. Lord, that was a broken picture. I said, what about any other broken pictures? What about anything else that's broken in the, in the Bible? And he brought, to, brought the story to me about the lady who had the alabaster box. And she put it over my Savior's head, and she broke it. And that sweet smelling savor flowed down his head, and she washed his feet. And Brother Tim, I said, Lord, wherever I'm at, if I'm in the United States or if I'm in the country of Africa, I want you to take my life. And if I need to be broken and humbled so that men can see the light of God, then take my life. God, if I have to be broken when I walk into a room and I, I meet men that, that, that need to be met, you know, when I'm making uh, deals on, on a school, I want them to be able to smell the sweet-smelling savor of the Holy Spirit illuminating through me. I saw, God, whatever you have for me, whatever you have, take my life and use it for your glory. And I know we have a lot of people here this evening but when was the last time you asked him, Lord, take my life. Take my life and use it. Lord, those people I meet on the street, do they see Jesus through me? Is my light hid in the picture? When was the last time you spoke to somebody about him? When was the last time you even called the name of Jesus? But does your life even live there? Does your life live up to that? I had a man I was working with in Southern California. I never said anything about being a, a Christian. I mean, he knew. I, I told him about things we did at church and everything. But he didn't know anything. Of that. He didn't know that I was saved. Or, But he come to me one day and he says, Mike, I can tell by the way your life, the way you're living your life, that you are different. He says, and I'm going through some marital problems right now. He said, would you pray for me? And we, built, we knelt down right there in the middle of that construction site. And I prayed for him. I said, God, help this man. He come to me a couple days later and he says, hey, I don't know what you did. And I don't know who you were talking to. But my situation has all turned around. And I was able to tell him about Jesus Christ. And one day I'm believing him to walk through the doors. To, and, be, and, and accept Christ as his Savior. But let me ask you tonight. I told you I'm a short-winded preacher. What is your life doing? Are you hiding it? Is it being illuminated for him? Is it in that picture that nobody else can see? Or is it being broken so that others can see Jesus Christ through you? Is it giving off a sweet-smelling savor? Or when you walk into the room, do men flinch and, and cringe and run? Or do they know that that man, that woman, is a man and woman of God? I trust tonight that you would continue to remember us in your prayers. I ask that you would... Put us on your Hallelujah. We and ourselves are nothing. And I stand here as humbled as I can. No glory to myself, no glory in what we're doing. But I pray tonight that you would just remember us in your prayers, that, you, that the Spirit of the Lord would help us to illuminate. Our life would be illuminated in a dark country. I don't know if I told Brother Snow the story or not, but he, the devil is real. And... Uh, the last time I was in Africa, 
Brother Jonas told me a story, and I'm, I'm very careful to even speak of it. But Brother Jonas was in Dar Salaam, which is the capital of, of Africa there, uh, of Tanzania. And they were, they were casting out the devil out of a man, and all of a sudden the, the devil manifested himself through this man. And he looked at Brother Jonas, and he says, I've been to your house. And Jonas was pretty shocked. Remember, Jonas lives in Moshi. It's, it's hours away. You, you fly there, or it's a couple of days' journey by car. And Jonas says, you've been to my house? He goes, yeah, I've been to your house. And Jonas says, okay, and why were you at my house? And he says, I came to kill the white man that was building churches here in Africa. He said, we were in his room. And we tried to approach him to kill him. And his eyes opened up and we saw the fire of God to come out. So we had to back away. And uh, he said we approached him again and again the same thing happened. And we left. We knew we could not touch him. And we desire your prayers once again because I'm taking my children into a, a dark country that the devil is real. It, it's, and I know he's real here, but he, real here, but he, they manifest theirself in a whole different way. But I know that greater is he that is in us than he that is in this whole world. And we are going to a country that uh, there, there's paganism. The Muslims are... are Everywhere, uh, they're, they're friendly right now because <laughs> they want to do business with you. But we need, to we need to lead them to Jesus. And that's not an easy feat with their, their religion. But I know that my God is greater. We desire your prayers that, that the Lord would help us to let our light shine. Not that, they, not that, not that any glory goes to us. But all the glory goes to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want the ushers to come. We're going to worship the Lord in giving, and then we're going to pray. Let me tell you something about Brother... Michael McMillan. I don't know. I believe this. We're supposed to go back this year. This is about the fifth year. How many is at your camp? 300, 350? This is the director of a camp. I mean, he has everything going. He has them up, them kids marching. He has classes. They got the food time down. They got the fun time down. They got the adults down. It's our whole church camp. It is one of the most organized, orchestrated things I've ever seen ever. So I know that he can go into this school. And raise up. A nation. And I'm believing it's going to start from this one and go to the next one, go to the next one. Because anytime you get ready to give to the Lord, you're not going to give God. So we want to be a blessing 
I'm just going to be very honest with you. A lot of missionaries plan, strategize out things for weeks and months, and all that's great, and it's good. I'm not against it. But I'm telling you, this couple has said we're going, and I think they've went to 18 churches, and we're number 18. They've, they've had a budget. They're trying to live on $7,000 a month in Africa. And they're not far from reaching that monthly budget. Now that's that's a house. You say, well, I'd like to live on 7000 Not on the other side of the world, you wouldn't. And there's a lot of things that goes into that. And here's the thing about budgeting. Stay with me. Is everybody that commits doesn't always come through. So you have to budget a little more because some months you're only going to get 6000 And here's a couple that's willing to go. So we're going to help them to go. How many is going to pray for them every day? Amen. I believe, I believe we could be taking a team over there to help them build a building. I believe we could be taking some individuals over there to help them do some things and see children running around touched by the power and the presence of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness and your grace and your goodness to us tonight. Thank you for this family that is willing to go. And I pray that you'd bless in this offering, bless the gift and the giver. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Everybody said, amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Glenna will be finishing her uh, midwife. Brother Mike was sharing with me last night. He plans on building a place where she can help ladies come in and uh, be a blessing right there on that land that God's. I want us. I want us to do two things. We're going to come. We're going to gather in this altar, and we're going to pray in just a moment. But I want us to pray that God. In a few days, they're going to leave and go. I want. I want. I want to stand before you by faith. I'm going to stand before you and tell you how they was able to purchase this land. How that God was able to work everything out. I want us to pray that's going to happen. And then the second thing I want us to do, and I wasn't going to get off into a lot of this, but there's a fellow there that always likes to cut up with me when I go to California. His last name, I believe, is Raz. Braz. How did he come to the Lord? It's usually Brother Braz is usually always in the horseshoe championship. So we're always cutting up and carrying on. A couple of years ago I said something about Michael, how I'd known him since he was a teenager. He said, Brother Snow, the reason why I'm here is because of that man right there who volunteered with the fire department. 
told me about Jesus at a time when I was in need, need of the Lord, and the Lord has saved me. What, what are you doing? What are we doing? We can't all go, but we can all be that which is broken and used for the Lord. I want you to stand with me all over this house. I want us to come to the altar. The altar is a place of sacrifice. The altar is a place of commitment. When we get here, we're going to make a fresh commitment to the Lord tonight. God, I want you to use me. I want you to break me. I want you to mold me. May I be that vessel. May I hear your voice. Lift your voice and your hands toward heaven. Say, Lord, help me. Everything I have, I give it to you.